Well, good morning. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning, and um, I'm delighted to uh, have my friend with me. Uh, you may recognize him, uh, Dr. Kent Brantley. Uh, Dr. Brantley is on clinical faculty um, at uh, uh, John Peter Smith um, Family Medicine Residency in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he's been busy since um, we hung out together in Liberia in 2014. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here with you this morning, and um, you know, um, it's amazing just uh, how God does what he does, and uh, I'm humbled to be here. Um, before we get started, uh, let's see, Kent, uh, how about if we open up in a word of prayer? Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for CCIH and this conference and uh, just the opportunity to be here just to have a conversation uh, with my friend uh, Kent Brantley, uh, just amongst uh, a body of believers. And Lord, I do pray this morning that it would compel us to integrate our faith with our work. And Lord, that, uh, that compassion would override fear, that we would conquer fear, Lord, to do our work. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, how many of you all were um, here and uh, watched the movie last night? Okay, so I, I actually we have a special guest this morning. I'd like to introduce one other person this morning. Um, her name is Dr. Linda Mabula. Linda, would you stand up, please? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, her sister led in the singing, uh, Debbie. Um, so it's a pleasure to meet Debbie, too. But uh, if you remember last night in the movie, uh, Linda played an instrumental role, and she gave uh, this drug, ZMAP, this novel drug. It's, it's not offered by Novartis, actually. <laughs> um, but maybe it will be. But uh, Linda administered uh, ZMAP uh, to Kent. It was the first time that it had ever been given to a human being. And um, so she really helped save Kent's life, but she really saved my life, too. Um, I had been there for about eight weeks, and um, Linda was really my replacement, and uh, had she not come, I don't think I would have survived, literally. But uh, today, um, like I said, Ken and I, we really, and I'm going to pull out some notes just to kind of keep me on track here. Um, but we really do, like I said, you know, we, we want to share our story with you, and I'm going to um, be asking Ken a lot of questions here in just a minute. But... Uh, um, you know, th this, uh, this conference, like I said, it's all about integration of faith uh, and, and um, our work. And uh, I do think that faith-based organizations do deliver the best type of health care in the world uh, because our motivation is so uh, eternal um, and it drives us to, to do what we do, to have unlimited compassion uh, over fear to do what we do. So we really want to weave those themes as we talk this morning. And, and um, we look forward to sharing our story. But before I start um, asking Kent um, a lot of questions and let him do more of the talking, um, I just really want to um, paint the picture of what we confronted in 2014 and just sort of establish a text, a context here of what we, of what we faced. Um, I'm going to take you back to Liberia in 2014. Um, as I said last night, we didn't go to Liberia to fight Ebola. Um, in fact, Kent was already there. Um, I mentioned last night the post-residency program, a two-year program, where several uh, people in this room have completed that program through World Medical Mission, and Kent was doing that um, in Monrovia uh, at Elwa Hospital. So we had been there for 10 years. Uh, in fact, um, we had about 400 um, Liberians on staff. So the great thing is, is that um, we had been there for a decade and really established um, trust amongst the Liberians. They knew that we we, we, we did, they were our own. Like I said, they, we worked with them every day. And so they were our own and they trusted us. And so that was instrumental, I think, in the work that we did establishing that relationship. Um, but really, Liberia had just completed about two decades or more of civil war. And it was a horrible civil war. Um, if you'll recall stories about uh, Charles Taylor, uh, the atrocities he committed, crimes against humanity, the Liberians didn't trust their government with good reason. Um, there was just, just heinous things that had been going on there. It's a Christian nation, but just underneath the surface, there's a lot of voodoo. Um, and just like I said, just a lot of distrust. Um, when Ebola first erupted, the Liberians, again, with good reason, they didn't believe in Ebola. Um, Samaritan's Purse, that's one of the best things I think we did is uh, we 
um, we just went out and um, and did a, a lot of public health intervention, just educating Liberians about what it was. But for the longest time, they didn't believe it. But eventually, you had to believe it. After 30,000 people became infected and about 11,000 people died, eventually you had to believe it. Um, and so this was what was going on. It was really, like I said last night, it was like Armageddon. You know, it was like a, it was, it really was. It was like, I've never been in an actual war, but it was like a war without being able to see your enemy. Um, and uh, again, uh, there was only one organization in the world that was um, fighting Ebola at the time. And, you know, let me just say this, before the outbreak in West Africa, the largest Ebola outbreak uh, was in Uganda. I think it was in 2000, and the lar and and it involved about 300 people. And this, you know, involved, like I said, over 30,000 people. And I think that's a very conservative estimate. So, to say the least, MSF was overwhelmed, and they were. Look at the papers. They were pleading for help, and um, like I said, I say this humbly. I really do. We were already there, and. You see what you, we see, you know, we saw what our brothers were going through, MSF, and it was like we had to help them. We had, you know, we felt prayerfully we had no choice. And um, so that's just the kind of the context where we were. Um, uh, I, uh, it got really, really big. Um, I arrived um, in uh, about, uh, I think I came about June 24th to Monrovia as the medical director of our disaster response. And uh, we had been working with SIM, uh, Bob is with SIM and a number of you all are, and we had been strategizing with them and MSF, how are we gonna conquer this? Because that was it in, for, in terms of, um, at, at that time, uh, eventually a lot of people did come forward and I do wanna give them credit. Uh, um, but at that time, that was really it. And so we were strategizing and basically um, SIM and Samaritan's Purse took on Liberia um, with the uh, assistance of MSF. MSF really taught us how to fight Ebola and then they were really um, taking on clinically uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone. And uh, when I arrived in country, uh, there was a young post-resident doctor there. He had only been there, how long had you been there? He had been there eight months. And um, so, you know, he had just finished his residency and there was, and anyway, and I appointed him to be the director of our Ebola treatment unit. So he was scared with good reason, but, uh, Anyway, I'd like to introduce again Kent Brantley. Kent, thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here, Lance. So, just tell us a little bit, Kent. Um, uh, how did you, how how did you and your family get called to Liberia? As, as you've mentioned, like we we did not move there to fight Ebola. Um, I I went to medical school because I felt God calling me to be a missionary. And I, I felt like I needed some tangible skill set to, to serve people uh, with the love of Christ. I felt like I wasn't a preacher or a teacher. I, I, needed, I needed that tangible skill set. And that's why I started down the road of, of medical education after, after I finished my undergraduate degree. And uh, Along the way, you know, medical education is a very long road. And so along the way, we tried to make choices that would nurture that calling. And one of the best choices I ever made in nurturing that calling was to marry a wife who shared that calling. And we made those decisions together, where we lived, how, how we lived, what we were involved in. Uh, we you know, tried to live within our budget and, and not accumulate unnecessary debt. <coughs> But we also did some, some practical things like attending Christian medical mission conferences. And we went to the Global Missions Health Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, several times during medical school and residency. And it was at the Global Missions Health Conference where I met the people from World Medical Mission and the post-residency program. And I learned about this program where for my first two years out of training, we could be paired with experienced medical missionaries to mentor us, to help us make that transition from resident physician in the United States to medical missionary. And as we got closer to the end of my training, that seemed like a really good way to get started in this calling we had been working towards for a decade. And we, we applied and we were accepted into the post-residency program and as we were in that collaborative effort to decide where Samaritan's Purse was going to send us, we were back at the, the 
Global Missions Health Conference again in 2012, and I met a guy named Rick Sacra at the SIM booth. And Rick and I had an immediate connection. Rick had been in Liberia for about 15 years, and he, he told me about his love for the, the work there and the people there and the work that Elwell Hospital was doing, and he shared his vision for starting a family medicine residency program at Elwell Hospital for Liberian physicians. And Rick and I had an immediate connection. We went back to the World Medical Mission booth and said, can we, do you think we could go to Liberia? And uh, we navigated that together and they, after a, a week or so, they said, yeah, yeah, you can go to Liberia. Uh, so that was, that was November of 2012. October of 2013, we packed our bags and moved with our, my, my wife, Amber, and our two young children who were five and three at the time, or, or four and two. I think my son was about to turn three. Uh, and we, we moved to Elwa to, to start our career that we had been dreaming about, to, to live lives of quiet, anonymous service in the name of Christ. Um, yeah, funny, huh? And, and that's, that's why we were there. That's what, that was God's calling on our life to serve people in the greatest of need um, with the love of Christ. Yeah, little little did we know what was going to uh, occur. Um, so um, yeah, so you were there at uh, Elwa, which is uh, if you've ever been to Monrovia, Eternal Love, Winning Africa, um, great hospital, and uh, you were there in the post residency program, uh, treating malaria and uh, typhoid, and and then you guys um, and, and I, I remember because I was on the other side, we started to hear about Ebola. Um, and I knew a lot about Ebola uh, just from an academic perspective. I'm interested in infectious and tropical disease. And so, uh, you know, we had head knowledge, but we had never treated it. And so we started to hear about it. It, was, uh, it first um, occurred in, in uh, the index case was in Guinea. Um, but then it started, uh, the borders were very porous. And um, you could uh, travel these three countries very easily uh, in Lofa County up in the, in the north. And you guys started to hear about it. Um, in fact, Debbie Eisenhut really uh, took initiative. She was another doctor at Elwa Hospital, and you guys started to make some plans. How, how did you start to get involved in Ebola? We, we first heard about the Ebola outbreak. I think Debbie saw it on the BBC website headlines, and she sent out an email to the other doctors and said, this is a little close for comfort. We might want to keep an eye on this. I think that was on a Friday night or Saturday, maybe Saturday night. Monday morning, we had a doctor's meeting like we did every Monday morning, except this one was a little different than most we had had. And I'm really thankful for Debbie and, and John Fankhauser, who had the wisdom to say, we, we have to prepare for this. I kind of, my initial thought was, that's, that's bad and it's scary, but it's far away. But they had the wisdom, the foresight to say, we have to be prepared. Because if a patient with Ebola shows up at our hospital, and if we're not prepared, our colleagues, our coworkers, our friends are going to pay the price for it. And um, we, we immediately, that day, began strategizing and preparing. And I think it was that same night that we had another meeting with the doctors and some people from the Samaritan's Purse um, office there on the same campus. We all met together and started strategizing how can we, how can we prepare and I think it was Karen Meyer from the SP office who had just gone to a meeting at the Ministry of Health that day. And she said, well, they, somebody told me about this manual that's online yeah. published by CDC and WHO in 1998, I think, yeah. um, called Infection Control for Viral Hemorrhagic Fevers in the African Healthcare Setting. Right. And Debbie went home, looked it up, printed out the entire manual, put it in a three ring binder and created a two or three hour hands-on curriculum and insisted that every member of our hospital staff go through this hands-on training. I mean, she, you know, she with John Fankhauser and Jerry Brown, who is the medical director, made everyone give their signature when they had gone through the training. And it was everyone from the 
the nurses and the doctors to the janitors and the cashiers. Yeah. And it covered, this course covered everything from what is Ebola and how is it spread to how do you mix a chlorine solution? How do you decontaminate a dead body? How do you put on and take off PPE? And at the same time, we started evaluating our facilities and realized we don't have anywhere to really safely isolate a patient. We had like two private rooms in the hospital, but they were right next to the other wards. And so I think it was Jerry Brown and John Fankhauser who sat down together and came out of their meeting and said, we're gonna use the chapel. Yeah. And the chapel is where we had our daily staff devotionals every morning. It was kind of, the, the hospital is almost horseshoe shaped and the, the chapel is in the middle of the courtyard. And there was a little bit of pushback about that initially from some of the hospital staff who said, you can't, we can't take this deadly disease and put it into our place of worship. And I think the response from the leadership was, what better place to put it? Like people have sought refuge and sanctuary in places of worship throughout history. What better place to use to offer sanctuary and hope than, than our chapel? And so we, the, the services team from SIM Elwa started uh, constructing a, a five bed isolation unit inside our chapel. And all of this was not for the purpose of becoming an Ebola treatment unit for the city of Monrovia. It was for the purpose of protecting our hospital staff, of being prepared for a worst case scenario where a patient with symptoms of Ebola shows up at our hospital. And, and that, was, that was our idea the whole time, was that if somebody tests positive, they'll, they'll be taken to the government facility, I'm sure, and, and we'll, you know, that will, but we'll, we need a place to safely isolate them while we do the test. Uh, that was our impetus for engaging in the fight against Ebola, but it quickly evolved as the outbreak grew and as uh, it became apparent that there was not anywhere else to send patients. Uh, we, when the, when the Ministry of Health called and said, we want to send two patients to your facility because you're the only functioning isolation unit in Monrovia, uh, that we picked up that mantle and said, this is, this is why we're here. We, we're here to serve the people of Liberia with the love of Christ. And it, it made, if anything, it made our purpose for being there all the more relevant and, and all the more acute. So just a, a little more context on, on the U.S. side at uh, Samar Samaritan's Porsche headquarters. I started, I had never met Dr. Debbie Eisenhut, but I, um, but we, we had our, you know, finger on the pulse. We knew what was going on. And uh, so I started communicating with uh, Dr. Eisenhut and uh, I too was like frantically trying, there really wasn't that much materials available about real uh, clinical treatment. Uh, and uh, I got my hand on uh, an MSF manual uh, and uh, we and we sent it over to Debbie. And, and as he said, they were making all these preparations. And uh, every day I would have conversation with uh, my boss and uh, vice president of programs and government relations, Ken Isaacs. And we knew that, you know, that treating Ebola was a real possibility. And, uh, um, you know, I never will forget the day he called me into his office and he said, Lance, this is it. He said, uh, we're going to do it. You know, we're going to we're going to go over. And um, and he asked me if I would. Um, lead that initiative and uh, I had been reading these manuals frantically because I knew you know that this was I knew if you know Ken Isaacs you know that this is going to be a real possibility and uh, so I you know tried to prepare myself in that way and assembled a lot of qualified people but um, we were praying um, earnestly because uh, it was very intimidating what it what did it do Kent in terms of your your faith and your prayer life <laughs> once we started treating patients with Ebola we were pretty busy. Yeah. I mean, it was it was very long days. Yeah. And and initially, John Fankhauser and Rick Sacre were both back in the States when we received our first Ebola patient. So Debbie Eisenhut and I agreed, I think kind of in, in conjunction with Jerry Brown, we said, okay, the two of us will treat patients with Ebola. Yeah. And the rest of the team, our, our Liberian and other African colleagues, 
we'll, we'll continue to run the rest of the hospital and the clinic and everything. So Debbie and I were splitting shifts in the ETU, which would often overlap by six or 12 hours because we were just trying to figure this out together and make sure we were all doing the right thing. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time for like contemplation and reflection. But I think what it did to our prayer life is that it stripped our prayers down to kind of the foundational base of all prayer. And our prayers became very simple. It was Jesus help. God help us. Because what else what else can you pray in when you're every patient you're treating is dying and and you're seeing this grow out of control in the community around you and people are so resistant. So our prayers became, I think, simpler and and very genuine. And and I looking back on it, when we did have time to to reflect later, I think it did the same thing to our faith. I think I think really this experience stripped away some parts of my faith that that I had always held on to that I learned through this experience maybe were not so essential. Um, it we've talked about collaboration and partnerships, uh, and so often there are things we hold on to in our faith that are barriers to our collaboration with others. We think we can't work with other people because they hold they hold a different view on this or that subject, or they're not a faith-based organization, or they're a faith-based organization of another brand or another faith altogether. Um, and and a lot of those barriers kind of went by the wayside when when dead bodies start rolling in the doors. And you know our partnership between Samaritan's Purse and MSF really was a great example of that because you you could probably speak more to this than than I could but SP and MSF had worked in the same places in responding to different disasters in the past but really had never partnered together but but with this with this outbreak with this disaster there was there was no other option and and um, but talk about that for a minute. I'm going to look up this quote. Yeah, I mean, it really was amazing. They were like uh, MSF. They were like our nemesis. Like we, <laughs> we were always at the same place. But I mean, I don't know. We just, yeah, but we, you know, we, I don't know. It was just, uh, I hate to say it, but humanitarian work is a bit competitive. And so we were a bit competitive. But like um, Kent said, when that is all you have and you're in the foxhole with them, you learn to love that those those guys. They taught us how to treat Ebola. I remember I went over to Gekadu, Guinea. It was right in the epicenter, where the three countries converge. And uh, um, I went over there with uh, her name is Aisha. She's from Morocco, and uh, um, I think she's uh, she was Muslim. And uh, but it was awesome because we became very good friends, and just I just really was able to share my faith with her and. Uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, anybody from MSF became Christians or not. I got to believe that they did. Um, but um, you know, to this day, some of my best friends in the humanitarian world are, are from you know that organization. And uh, but it is really neat how you know God, He can use anybody. Um, he doesn't need you. Um, he can use anybody. And uh, I found that out. And um, so. You just have to make yourself available. Um, but it's neat how, you know, who God calls forward. He loves to use the weak to do the mighty. And, um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, if we see, we acknowledge that God can use anybody. And you don't have to look very far in Scripture to see God intentionally using people who were, who were diametrically opposed to him. Assyria. And we've talked about Naaman, Pharaoh, and God used those people. Um, and I think we need to not be too high and mighty on our own high horse to think that because we're pursuing him and following him that we're the only ones he could use. 
to do this job. But that someone from, from MSF wrote a book about the Ebola response. And I'm I, sorry I don't have the title in front of me. Um, but Linda actually sent me a picture of this page from the book where they start to talk about their partnership with Samaritan's Purse. And it says, um, different forces drive us, but that doesn't matter because our motivations are strong enough to compel both of our organizations to go far beyond our comfort zones. They are pleasantly surprised by how agreeable we can be in person. <laughs> And we are equally surprised by how many dirty jokes they find funny. <laughs> Said, we, we make fun of each other while we build a small team, bridging the gap between godliness and secularism, bound together in our work to save the people of Monrovia from Ebola. And uh, I remember I, I, I told you, um, just when we were over there, um, you would just cling to things that God had for you like you know have you read scripture a uh, um, hundred times and then you read it again and it has new meaning uh, the fourth chapter of uh, Esther um, just resonated with me uh, over and over again uh, her um, cousin Mordecai he says perhaps God has called you to the kingdom for such a time as this and remember he said he prefaced it by saying that don't think that you are safe you know hanging out in the king's palace um, because you too, you know, she was a Jew and uh, she was going to be subject to uh, the annihilation like everybody else. Um, and it was basically what it said to me was, you know, God didn't need Esther. If she didn't stand up and rise up to the occasion, God was going to use someone else. It was the same thing with what we were doing, Kent. Um, if we didn't, it wasn't about us. It was really about what God, it was God's work. And uh just again, um, he could have you know used anybody, but um, we happened to be there. And uh, again, so it's just uh, I think that just speaks into uh, again just um, coupling your faith with your work. Um, and we were scared to death. Were you scared? I don't think anyone who's ever treated Ebola would tell you that they weren't scared in in the middle of that outbreak. Yeah, I never will forget. Uh, uh, the day I got a call um, from this guy, you, you, yeah, uh, Dr. Or Franklin Graham's always said, you really made a bad week for all of us. So I got this call one morning. It was really miraculous. His, uh, his wife and children had just been, uh, just flown uh, to Texas. Uh, Amber's brother was getting married and Kent was going to join them in about a week. Um, and they had just left and they called me and, um, or excuse me, Kent called me and he said, Lance, he says, don't freak out, but I have a fever. And, uh, and we both knew what that could mean. Um, Kent tested himself four times that day for malaria, and it was the only time in my life I ever wished someone would test positive for malaria. <laughs> but they were all four negative, weren't they? We tested you for Ebola because we knew certainly he was high risk. And uh, it tested negative, but we knew per protocol that you had to wait three days. So we quarantined him to his home. Uh, for three days and really to our chagrin he just started getting worse and worse um, and uh, I remember an analogy that just came to my mind at that time it really felt like uh, like you were in a pool of water and the pool kept getting deeper and deeper because we just had so few workers and we were so overwhelmed because we were taking care of Liberia and then as you'll learn, as you already know, two of our own became positive. So three days later, I'll never forget, Kent, um, we befriended, uh, and I'll share with you in just a second, it just so happened. Um, God orchestrated miracle after miracle there. I cannot tell you, I mean, it, it blows my mind to this day how, what he did, but um, I befriended a doctor there, Dr. Lisa Hensley. She's with the NIH. She was one of the key developers of this novel drug, ZMAP, and we had become friends. And uh, I never will forget, three days later, Kent was getting a lot more symptomatic. And um, I got a call uh, or a text from Lisa Hensley. We had a, a pseudonym for Kent because we didn't want anyone to know what was going on. And it said, I am very sorry to inform you that Thomas Snell is positive. And when I got that information, I, I couldn't breathe. 
I didn't know what we were going to do. Kent, what did, uh, when, and you just became more and more symptomatic, and, and I shared with you, you know, I said, Kent, I'm so sorry to tell you, but your test is positive. What was going through your mind? Now, you were standing outside my bedroom, outside the window, and John Fankhauser was standing there in, in full PPE beside my bed, and he woke me up. I really, I thought he was waking me up to tell me that he was going, that he was going to have to doff his PPE and go out of the house. So I was kind of confused at first. And then I saw that you were standing there and I woke up and I sat up in the bed a little straighter and you, you said those words to me and it was, it was really just very matter of fact. I mean, I think, I think I had been expecting it. And so my first response really came from my doctor mind. Okay, so what's next? What's our plan? What are we going to do? And you and I had been talking about plans just days before I got sick. We had had a meeting with MSF to talk about contingency plans in case one of our workers was exposed. So I knew that that we had protocols, we had plans. So my thought was, okay, what's, what are we going to do? Right. And then my husband mind kicked in. And I think I asked you and John, how am I going to tell Amber? Um, I, I talked to Amber right, right after that. I called her. And, and then over the next little while, I talked to my parents and, and I think all five of my siblings. And um, it was very, I, I didn't cry at all that night. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, we all, we all talk about the peace that passes understanding and it becomes almost cliche but I have no other, I have no way to understand the peace that I felt that night, except to, to say that it was a gift from God. To know, to, I, the feeling I had was, even if I die of this, it's okay. Like, I know this is, I know we're doing the right thing here. And one of my, one of my college professors called me the next morning. He was a Bible professor, and he was actually, scheduled to be a guest preacher at my church in Fort Worth, Texas that day. My diagnosis came on a Saturday night. He called me on Sunday morning because my one of my brothers texted him. And he asked me, "What are you what are you thinking about? What are you how are you feeling?" And out of nowhere or, or from the spirit, I said, "I feel a lot like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego." Like I know, I know that God can save me. I know that this disease is not a hundred percent uniformly fatal. I know that God can save me, even if He doesn't. I, I desperately want to be faithful. I don't want to be the guy who is faithful to the point of taking his family to Africa, who then gives up in the end because he got sick. So uh, I had been there about uh, at this point about eight weeks and. Uh, uh, Linda Mabula showed up. Like I said, she was the cavalry for me. She was supposed to replace me. I, there was no way I was going to leave at this point. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, God knew what He was doing. Um, everybody there had such a critical role. I mean, th we we had to have everybody there because, like, they were playing critical roles. So, uh, Linda really, uh, she at that point she was really leading the charge in, in terms of, like I said, we were still caring taking care of the, you know, Liberia. We were in Monrovia, we had an Ebola treatment unit. We didn't describe to you, but we kept making bigger and bigger Ebola treatment units to uh, accommodate the patients and we could never make a big enough unit. Um, and we had another uh, big Ebola treatment unit in FOIA. And um, uh, Linda was um, really very busy taking care of uh, our ETU in Monrovia, uh, it was called Elwa II. Uh, and, and, and taking care of Kent and Nancy. Um, 
And there's so many key people I wish I could, I could tell you. SIM played an unbelievable role. John Fankhauser and Debbie Eisenhut, we could have never done, uh, done it without them. And what I didn't tell you, too, is along the way, a couple people, they would get fevers like John. God, when John got a fever, it was devastating um, because he was devastating for you. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was like the primary caregiver for a while for Kent. And then he got a fever. And so I had to isolate him uh, because we thought he had Ebola. He tested negative. But there was another critical player that was taken out of the chess game. And um, so while Linda was leading the clinical work, um, one, uh, two things uh, started to evolve, uh, Kent, that really gave us some glimmer of hope is, one is, uh, I told you I met this doctor. She just so happened to be in Monrovia at the uh, reference laboratory in Monrovia. They were doing PCR on Ebola. And um, she was there from the NIH. She was an expert in viral hemorrhagic fevers. Like I said, she had spent the last decade of her life dedicated to development of novel drug therapies uh, for these RNA viruses. And, um, she happened to um, be working on this one drug called ZMAP, and there was only four um, there was only four courses of therapy in the whole world, and one course happened to be in Sierra Leone. It was at the the bed of uh, a doctor, uh, Dr. Sheikh Umar Khan. He was the national hero of Sierra Leone. He he led up the Lhasa fever clinic that had been converted to an Ebola unit. He got Ebola, and um, they offer, It was at his bed. And, and they agonized whether do we give this drug to this doctor or not. And it was very, very controversial. And I, I don't know what the right thing was. They did not give it to him. Uh, he did pass away. And Dr. Hensley, I met with her, and she offered me the drug, ZMAP. And, um, and we talked about a number of uh, novel therapies. Um, I, I talked to all her colleagues, Gary Kobinger, uh, Larry Zitlin, these were world authorities. I didn't know who they were at the time. Gene Olinger, these were the developers of uh, ZMAP. And she put me in touch with them. We, we, we called them together on her, her cell phone. They emailed me. They started telling me about this drug called ZMAP that had never been given to a human, but they just had given. It hadn't been published yet, but they had just given it to 18 macaques with advanced disease. And um, it, 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 it did very well. And so Lisa and I, we went to your window one night and we told Ken about this drug and um, and then we also I uh, started sharing with Ken about the possibility of an evacuation we at Samaritan's Purse searched high and low for any plane that could bring he and Nancy back to the states and there was none until we finally stumbled upon this one little organization that had done contract work with the Defense Department uh, called Phoenix Air out of Cartersville Georgia so Ken <laughs> Um, with we, we, we told you about ZMAP, and I started talking to you about evacuation. What were your thoughts about taking this drug and, and about possibly being evacuated? I, I remember that conversation with Lisa Hensley. I remember she came to my bedroom window and told me about ZMAP, which I didn't know the name of, but this antibody cocktail, and two or three other novel therapies for Ebola. And I remember at the end of what really was an informed consent discussion, um, <laughs> saying, I think if those antibodies were available, I'd be willing to, to receive them. I don't know about the others, but I think I'd take the antibodies. And um, you know, I recognized as much as I could in that state that that was a totally unproven therapy that could kill me. Um, yeah, we were worried about anaphylaxis. <laughs> So, so my hope really was not that this drug was going to be a miracle cure, but I was willing to try it. Um, the evacuation, the idea of being evacuated really did give me a lot of, of hope. A lot of, it, I, was, I was longing for that opportunity, uh, not because I thought necessarily that I would survive if I was evacuated, but I thought at least if they can get me to Europe or, or maybe even to the United States, at least even if I die there, maybe my family can be close to me when I die. Because there's no way they were going to be able to come back to Liberia. But, you know, maybe they could fly to Belgium and at least be at the hospital when I died. Um, and that, that actually was like that was something I was holding on to. 
was, okay, maybe I can get close to my family. I keep looking at Bob Lee's over here because we just met for the first time yesterday. But from what I understand, he actually was played a, a pivotal role in making that connection with the State Department and uh, eventually what, what eventually led to uh, Phoenix Air and, and the, the Phoenix Air and Emory connection. Uh, so there were, you said there were so many miracles along the way. And it, it, it was more than just the coincidences of the things that happened in real time at, at that moment. It was these connections that go back years. And it was, you know, Phoenix Air had developed this airborne biocontainment system in like 2001 for the SARS outbreak. And then they had never used it. Not a single time. And so the guy from the State Department called Phoenix Air and said, hey, you know that, that airborne biocontainment system you guys used to have? Is that you still have that? And they said, well, yeah, it's in storage. And he said, does this still work? And they said, yeah, it should. And he said, will it work for Ebola? And they said, uh, I think you better come to Georgia. <laughs> uh, but ZMAP, and we've, you and I have spoken, we got to go to Kentucky Bioprocessing in Owensboro, Kentucky, to see the, the plant where they make that, that medication. And, uh, <laughs> and to see the history behind the development of that drug, yes. a single course of which was made available to us in, in West Africa where Ebola had never been before. Um, and and we, we learned about the history of this drug, that it was, it was built on the shoulders of seven Nobel Prizes in science and had been years and years in the making. And this company had not only taken the science of those, they, the, the NIH and the Special Pathogens Lab in Canada had been working on, on Ebola treatments and they, they collaborated together, something that never happens in academic science. They gave up their, their proprietary information to each other because they said, maybe if we work together, we can come up with something better together than what either one of us is doing on our own, and they did. And, and then the company that, that manufactured it, even their process for manufacturing, they had invented and, and tweaked over time. All of these things that came together to give Nancy and me a course of that drug in Liberia. Yeah. So uh, I'll take you back to Thursday. Uh, I forget the date. 31st, the 31st of 30th. July. OK. I, in the, in the, in, in that morning, uh, I went to Kent's window. And, and um, Kent, at that point, you were still doing there. I think that was Wednesday. Wednesday, OK. Um, and he was doing fair. Um, and uh, we had this conversation. At this point, it, it broke my heart because Several times it looked like the plane was coming and then it didn't. And I had to have to tell, I'll never forget, I devastated Kent when I told him at one point the plane wasn't coming to evacuate him. But at this point, it looked like everything was a go, um, that we had made arrangements with the State Department and they were going to come. And, uh, and Kent said to me, he said, uh, and at this point, um, I had received the Z-Map. Um, I, I got it and I was scared to death. And uh, I had, you know, we had one course of therapy and two patients. And uh, there was three vials. You're supposed to give it, um, you know, three, uh, each vial three days apart. And um, so that morning I, I said, you know, I was like, Kent, what do I do? And, and, and he, said, he said, Lance, you give the Z-Map to Nancy. He goes, it looks like I'm going to be evacuated and I'm doing better than her. So, so I kind of acquiesced to his request. But then later that evening, um, I came back, and a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, I'm an internist by training, and uh, I've worked a lot in the ICU, and I knew what sepsis looked like, and, and Kent was on death's door. Um, and I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, he could barely breathe. His temperature was 104.8. 
Um, his saturation was in the 80s. Um, he was going to die. He hadn't walked in two days. And um, I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. And um, I remember I called, I, I texted Kendall. And I said, Kendall, just you get everybody praying. I said, uh, and, and I remember I just said to him, I just said, Kent, he could barely talk. And I just said, we're going to give you the, the Z map. And he said, OK. And um, Debbie Eisenhut had had, um, um, the, again, the plan was that we were going to give it to, to, to um, Nancy. And um, remember, it was at minus 20 degrees. And, but Debbie had put one of the vials under Nancy's arm. Because I, I had uh, one of the other vials, and it was only like halfway defrosted. And I was like doing everything. I was putting it under my leg and <laughs> trying to defrost this, this drug. And, uh, and then I remembered that, that she, Debbie had put one under Nancy's arm. And so I didn't have PPE on, but I raced over. And, um, and uh, we, we, uh, Debbie got it from under her arm uh, at Nancy's house. Nancy was at her house. And uh, she put it in three plastic bags. And we sprayed it with chlorine and put it in a, a bucket. And I drove it, uh, I raced it back over to Kent's house. And I handed it to Linda Mabula, and uh, they gave it to, to Kent. Um, and um, and uh, when, when they gave it, he began to shake real violently, um, Rigers. Um, and um, I didn't know what was going on. But, but I, all of a sudden, I just you mentioned that peace that passes all understanding. I, like, I really just all of a sudden, I was like, it, I, I recognize it really is a good sign. It was like uh, the, the antibody was neutralizing the virus. And really, in the course of an hour, you became way better. Um, you want to describe yeah. that? Um, I, I thought I was going to die of respiratory failure. Yeah. I thought this is it. I did it. too. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to keep breathing, and I'm going to suffer. They have no way to breathe. We didn't have a ventilator. We didn't even have like a bag mask ventilator. Um, but as the, the rigors resolved and I kind of stabilized, um, I remember saying I need to get up and go to the bathroom, which I hadn't done in like a day and a half, or two days. And um, I remember the ZMAP was still running because I think it was Tim Mosier who was in the room who was going to help me go to the bathroom. Every other time in the, in the 10 days preceding that, if I had had IV fluid running and I needed to go to the bathroom, we'd roll the wheel down, stop the fluid, and I'd carry the bag into the bathroom and hang it on the mirror while I used the bathroom. And I, I wanted to stop this IV, and he's like, no, no, we got to leave this one running. <laughs> um, I, I remember that that night... I, I, you said I, I was much better, and I was, um, but I wasn't better. Right. And I, and I stabilized. Yeah, there are a lot of things I don't remember about that night. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy Mazella is one of the nurses who, who came in to take care of me uh, in the night, that night, and I, I have no memory of that. I don't remember Kathy being in there. And the first time I got to see her after all of this, which was like a year and a half later, um, she started talking to me. She, she expressed to me that she felt like this, this guilt because she said I had been so anxious that night, like just uncontrollably anxious. And she had tried everything she could to make me comfortable, change my pillow, put the blanket on me, take the blanket off of me, give me... and. And there was nothing she could do to make me comfortable or to ease my anxiety. She said at one point, I, she was like, I don't know what to do for you. And she said, I, I looked at her and said, sit down in that chair and pray. <laughs> but I don't remember that at all. What I remember, <laughs> what I remember is that Ed Carnes showed up and sat with me for hours after I received the Z map so that I wouldn't be alone. The thing I remember, I just got to highlight, you know, it, it was the most miraculous recovery I've ever seen in, in my years of medicine. And it really, I, I posed to you earlier, what did this do for your prayer life? I mean, I've been a Christian since I was six years old, but it made me believe in the power of prayer 
more than anything else ever. I mean, because Kent was, in my mind, he was going to die. I knew he was going to die. And to see that recovery, oh, my gosh. You, you had told Kendall Caulfield, the SP country director, to spread the word, tell everybody to pray right now. Yeah. It's not looking good. And you had called my family yeah. and told them it's not looking good. Yeah. And so everyone at, at Elwa was praying for me. All of my family gathered together in Texas was praying. Amber called or texted somebody from our church and they, the word started spreading. But I have met so many people that I don't even know, or some that I, that I do know, but I had no contact with at the time, who said, you know, that Thursday, I just really felt burdened to pray for you for some reason. And I don't, I, it blows my mind. So it blows my mind, too, in a good way. Um, so. Kent, you stabilized that night, and um, everything just kept falling into place. We had this evacuation plan that we implemented the next day. We, we made two makeshift ambulances out of pickup trucks, and uh, we had met with, I mean, it was crazy, the, the you know, uh, like w the doors got open. We met with the vice president of Liberia, the president of Liberia, the U.S. Embassy, the State Department, the CDC. I mean, I'm just saying God made all these arrangements, uh, and, and it was unbelievable. So the next day, we waited till after midnight, and um, we had a, a, a convoy of these two ambulances, and we, we drove Kent to Roberts International Airport, and it was really, it was so surreal. We just arrived there, and it's pitch black, and the gates just, they just open. It was like, just magically open. And we just drive onto the tarmac, and there's no planes there except for Phoenix Air, the Gulfstream G3 by Phoenix Air. And uh, I remember Dr. Doug Olson, he comes down and uh, he's with Phoenix Air, and he had on, they all had on their PPE, we had our PPE on. And, and a lot like you saw um, this guy get off the ambulance in uh, Emory, um, he did the same thing. We helped him, but he walked onto the Phoenix. Uh, uh, or, or walked onto the you know the the Gulfstream G3 and uh, and and you flew off, and we had no idea, and I don't think you did either what happened uh, what was going to happen on the other side. Yet yeah, did you in your wildest dreams? I mean, we could have never made this up. I mean, <laughs> I mean, God is a big God, and did you have any idea that that this was going to have the implications, the global implications that it did? No, I had I had no idea. And when I got to Emory and Amber called me on the phone for the first time after I got into the isolation room there, she said, we watched you walk off the ambulance. And I thought they must have been watching from the sidewalk or from somewhere in the hospital or something. I said, you were watching me? She said, I can't. The whole world was watching you. I had no idea. And it wasn't until probably after Nancy was... I guess the fact that I could watch Nancy's arrival on CNN and then see her come into the isolation unit next to me, that was probably when I started to realize this is a big deal. <laughs> um, but I, I never, as I, as I recovered, I started to be able to turn on the TV and watch the news and I was getting reports from Liberia about how things were getting so much worse. Um, I started to gain some idea of the, the, the reach of this outbreak as well as the, uh, the opportunity God had, was giving me to be a voice. Um, I, never, I never imagined that ahead of time. I never dreamed of it. I never asked for it. But I felt a responsibility that, you know, Nan Nancy left the hospital quietly and anonymously, and I'm glad that she was able to do that. But I f felt like for some reason it would be a, a disservice, it would be dishonest of me to leave in that quiet way and not acknowledge 
what God had done and, and to say thank you publicly to people. Um, and, and now I've spent the last three years, July 15th, spent the last three years um, with this platform that I expected to go away a long time ago. Just one thing I just to add is uh, um, there's so many stories, you know, but um, what we ended up doing, um, so Kent got the first file of ZMAP and um, we, we ended up, we split the doses and uh, which they told us not to do, but we did it anyway. <laughs> Um, because we felt like we had to. We had two patients and, and one course of therapy, but Kent got um, the first vial, and then um, the, uh, um, the, and I never will forget, it was, like I said, it was so surreal. The, uh, all the doctors from Emory, I had a, like a FaceTime with uh, Bruce Ribner and, and uh, his um, colleagues from Emory, because they had never, you know, they had all the equipment and the isolation uh, unit and so forth, but they had never treated Ebola or never given ZMAP, and so, um, I spoke to them for about an hour and, and was describing how we did it and how Linda did it and uh, um, and uh, that was crazy. But uh, we gave him the first vial and then uh, Nancy got the second uh, and the third vial. And then um, they contacted, Emory contacted Kentucky Bioprocessing because they had one of the other courses of therapy and they, they were able to drive it down to Emory. And so when Kent got on the other side, Emory um, gave him um, doses two and three and gave Nancy the third dose, so it was amazing. But yeah, I think uh, Kent, like you and Nancy, really um, have used it in an, uh, an amazing way, this, this platform. Um, and I, I wanna say this, Kent, I think, I really, I don't, you know, it, it's like, I think God, like I know God, and it sounds crazy, but he, like he, he picked uh, Kent Brantley and Nancy Wrightball maybe to get Ebola because they've really, in a different way, they've really handled uh, this platform. But um, Ken, I was wondering if you could just sort of speak a little bit just more to us, because like I said, we want to get back to, you know, integration of, of um, uh, faith in our work and, and utilizing compassion uh, to overcome fear. But um, you did, a, a, I think, a, a commendable job. I mean, it was, it was, we had a real ambivalence when we left Liberia because, like you said, it wasn't getting better, it was getting worse. Um, and, and I think um, really, I, you know, kind of what happened um, at Elwa uh, with the two of you becoming infected, it really, it was a pivotal event because it really opened the eyes of the world uh, and, um, um, and it gave it the attention it deserved. Um, can you just speak about that? Well, uh, <sighs> I think, I think in the United States, it made a difference when two Americans got Ebola because it very quickly became no longer simply a, a bad thing that was happening on the other side of the world to people who were different than me. It became one, one of us. And I think whenever you put a, a, a face on a tragedy, it makes it more personal. And, and so it became more personal, less, less vague to people on this side of the world. Um, and it's unfortunate that that has to happen, but I think that happens in lots of areas, not just major disasters like this Ebola outbreak. I think, that, I think that's true for things like malaria and clean drinking water problems. And it, it doesn't bother us personally until it becomes personal. Um, Which is, I mean, I just want to inject here, uh, interject here. It, I mean, because we were, you know, like I said, MSF was pleading for help and we were pleading for help. Um, and it's heartbreaking that it has to, you know, that what you're saying is true because we, we so, we were desperately trying to draw attention to, to what was going on in West Africa. Like I said, I mean, there was like uh, 11,000 people died uh, from this. And, um, and it was like, where, you know, where is everybody? It was, it was unbelievable. So I, I think what happened in America after with, with my illness and, and Nancy and me both being brought back 
to America, um, it be, people became aware of it, and then this kind of wave of panic swept the country, and people people started responding from a place of fear, and and a place of of self preservation, and so my plea for those months that followed was that we we have to choose to act out of compassion rather than out of fear. Yeah. And that's, for one thing, that's easier to say than it is to do. But I, but I think it's something we need to understand. It, to, to, to follow Jesus is to live a life of compassion. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commandments. Everything else hinges on those two. And so, so we, as followers of Jesus, are called to have compassion on the, on the suffering. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to be afraid. It doesn't mean that you're not going to face really difficult fearful situations, but it's a choice. It is a choice to say, I'm not going to let this fear be the motivation for the way I respond to this person. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to have compassion. And uh, one of my favorite passages in scripture is Mark six. Uh, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, except it has nothing to do with the feeding of the 5,000 that makes it my favorite story. It's Mark 6, 34, where Jesus has just said to the disciples, let's go away and find a quiet place to rest for a while. And they get on the boat and they go across the lake and this crowd follows them and they get off the boat and there's this big crowd of needy people that they've been trying to get away from. And Mark 6, 34 says, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And that that phrase, he had compassion on them, in the Greek is the word, it comes from the, the word splangnizomai. means to be moved in the inward parts. It's where we get the name for the splanknic nerves that innervate the guts. It's a very visceral image. He didn't just feel sorry for them. He was moved to the core of his being because of the way he saw them, because he saw their need, that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And, and our English word compassion comes from the Latin, means to suffer with. So when I think you put those two images together of being moved in the inward parts and to suffer with, it is more than uh, a, a mental assent to have pity on someone. It is being moved to the core of your being so much so that you would relinquish your own right to comfort and safety and enter into the suffering of the person in front of you. And, and that, I think that is our call as Christian health workers is to, to set aside our own rights, our own sense of entitlement to safety and comfort and security for the purpose of entering into the suffering of the person in front of us in the hopes of touching them with the love of Jesus. Thank you, Kent. Um, I, I want to um, sort of conclude it. I just want to read this scripture in 1 John four eighteen. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment, but he who has fear or but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So um, in God, there is, you know, perfect love and no fear. And um, I think uh, you're right, Kent, that, you know, that, that kind of love, that kind of compassion motivates us uh, beyond um, the obstacles and, and the fear before us um, to serve and to integrate our, our faith and our work, um, you know, and, and, it, and, and in the end, I just, I guess I'd like to conclude, you know, just by saying that it, it's really, it's, it's really not about us in the end. It's really, it's about Christ and it's about 
God. I mean, he can, he can use anybody. Um, I hope we've emphasized that um, to do his good work. And so as uh, healthcare professionals, as Christian healthcare professionals, um, I, I pray that we make ourselves available, um, that we uh, embed ourselves in that, that compassion and love uh, to serve others. Um, so Kent, thank you so much for coming and, and talking to us today. I think we have time for a couple of questions. If there are any questions. Uh, I'm Sambi Duale. I'm uh, a member of CCIH for many years uh, and working on outbreak is one of my area. And I think in uh, 2011, myself and some colleague, we published a review paper on all the Ebola outbreak that happened until 2011. And all those outbreak, the number of cases and the death was way less than the one West Africa outbreak. So I'm, I just want to make a case that really God used with us to help. And one lesson that we learned is getting that plane to bring Ken back or getting to be able to access Zima is some of the things that you want our health professional, our church leader, to reach out, not for Zima or a flight, but to reach out to those who make decisions to strengthen the basic health care system. Some of us that work in Ebola, if our church hospital have a good infection control thing in place, we can really uh, reduce some of the impact of those uh, infectious diseases. Uh, I was not here yesterday because I was flying back from London and, and we were at Chatham House discussing a paper making the case of strengthening the basic healthcare system as a way of responding to routine health needs and preparing to respond to outbreaks. Uh, because in West Africa, our health system was so weak, so the Ebola took advantage and it just spread as a wildfire. So the, the faith-based organization have a lot of a contribution to make in the, uh, the uh, preparedness response to outbreak. So use that opportunity, as you are doing, to make the case so that we can really serve people everywhere. Thank you. I, I think that's absolutely right. And what we saw in West Africa is that the health systems were so um, kind of weak to start with that Ebola devastated them. And a stronger health care, a stronger basic health care system will have more resiliency to withstand and better respond to an outbreak like Ebola, uh, and also to recover from it afterwards. I think that's a very good case to make. Yeah, a question. Um, from, from the perspective that you have given and your experience with the, the ZMAP, um, how different will it be if um, another outbreak came out today? Does the, the drug ZMAP make any difference in, in the coming future for Ebola? Um, I, I think, um, you know, there's some great things that came out of uh, the outbreak in West Africa. Um, it definitely propelled um, uh, forward um, pharmaceutical development of uh, vaccines, both passive and uh, active uh, vaccinations. So um, they've, um, they've 
uh, increased sub significantly the manufacturing of ZMAP, and, and ZMAP is really utilized uh, like we did for Kent for post exposure prophylaxis mainly. So if you get it, it, it works. Uh, at least anecdotally, I can tell you it works very, very well. <laughs> um, they had, they did do a, a study on ZMAP. Um, unfortunately, they waited late, um, and uh, they really didn't have enough power to really prove, so it didn't reach statistical significance. But it, it did. The um, tendency was very favorable that it definitely works. But uh, what I'm even more excited about is a vaccine. There's a couple vaccines actually out. Uh, one I'll just mention. It's called the VSV vaccine vesicular stomatitis virus, um, and um, uh, they actually published a, an article um, about a year ago in The Lancet. Um, they did, um, uh, they, uh, did what's called double ring vaccination, uh, a lot like they do in polio now. So if there's an outbreak, they immediately, they vaccinate with this VSV vaccine uh, for Ebola, they vaccinate all the contacts and then all their contacts. So it forms a double ring and it was 100% effective. Um, so that thrills me. So I'm very excited about the, uh, the development since the outbreak of some of these uh, vaccinations. Hi, I'm Ann, I'm Ann Peterson. Um, I got there late. I was running a school of public health and after you got sick and got better, it kept getting worse and I found that incredibly distressing and so I'm incredibly thankful that World Vision allowed me to go to Liberia and Sierra Leone and look at what was happening with um, the faith-based organizations, the churches, and the relationship to the government. So I have two questions for you. One is the church, again, was a little mixed in their response. Your examples have been working an, uh, an FBO, NGO, working with a secular but what was your experience about how the church was responding and would there have been a way to mobilize them earlier? And then as I looked at it and thought about it from a medical perspective, the, you just talked, Lance, about the vaccine. The one that seemed, intervention that seemed transformative or could have been, would have been a rapid diagnostic test. Amen. So that when that patient first came in, you knew which were malaria, and which you needed to sequester for yeah. Ebola. How transformative would that have been? And you know, we're still waiting for that to be disseminated broadly. Lance mentioned the the idea that Samaritan's Purse had been in Liberia for a decade, and and had this network for from all of the work they had been doing prior to Ebola, and I think that played a huge role. Um, especially especially as, as Samaritan's Purse kind of retooled and went back a second time um, after, after Nancy and I had, had been brought back to Atlanta. Um, it was that network of churches and community leaders that allowed Samaritan's Purse to, to gain trust in communities and to spread the education that helped prevent the spread of the disease. And so it was, it was those networks of churches and, and community leaders that played a hugely pivotal role in, in finally bringing things under control. And as for a, a rapid diagnostic test, I think, I think you're right that that, would, that could play a tremendous role in helping to, to catch up to an outbreak at the beginning rather than at the tail end, and there was a 15-year-old girl who won the Google Science Fair in 2015 for developing a temperature-stable rapid Ebola test. Um, it, it has not been produced yet, but and, and I know there are other uh, other organizations that are working on similar tests. Um, that yeah, that's that is that was one of one of the um, limiting factors in the early response was that it took so long to get a result on, on a patient. Yeah, we would wait like three days and, and you would have a person, they eventually tested negative and meanwhile they've been sitting next to a person with Ebola, you know, vomiting and with copious vomiting and diarrhea for three days and there's no question a lot of people became infected in the Ebola treatment unit. So 
Um, you're right, uh, and that would have been a huge game changer. So that would that would have been huge. Um, and then I'll just uh, emphasize. Uh, I think we need to draw it to a close here. But I'll just emphasize. I'll close with this: is um, you know, the, and I'm glad you brought up the church because, um, like, and Kent's already said this, but I'll just emphasize it: the church is huge. Um, because the network of churches, I mean, there's churches all over Liberia, and they're in the community. They are a part of the community, and they are so powerful at um, implementing public health measures. I mean, if you teach the church, you know, about, um, you know, utilizing, um, uh, utilizing chlorine-based um, solution and soap, even just soap will kill Ebola. It, you know, it, 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 it'll kill Ebola. And, you can distribute uh, modified PPE through the church and 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 um, public awareness programming and how do you prevent Ebola? And I think the church did play an incredibly pivotal role in bringing this uh, Ebola um, to a close. So um, the church is is so powerful. Uh, uh, it's such a powerful tool that we can utilize um, in epidemics like Ebola. So I think we've been um, given the signal to draw it to a conclusion. But again, we thank you so much. It's been a real honor.